All right, good afternoon. Um, a little slim, but we are gonna try to bring as much energy as the last panel. Uh, we're gonna do our best. I've got a great panel for you today. Um, I will have them introduce themselves in a minute. We have, I will have them all walk out now. Miri Oskan from uh, UC Riverside, Karuba Krishnaswamy from University of Missouri, and Jay Walls from the University of Illinois System. So while they get themselves, yes, let's give them a round of applause. That's good. Come on. I know it's us standing between you, reception, gala, so come on, let's bring the energy at the end of the day, right? Um, okay, so uh, I am uh, with the Lemelson Foundation. You may have heard a little bit about us earlier today from Phil Weilerstein, who's from VentureWell. They are one of our longtime partners and grantees. Uh, we were founded by Jerry Lemelson and his wife, Dolly. Jerry is one of the most prolific inventors in the 20th century and felt that inventions, inventors, and independent inventors particularly were under-invested in, and I would imagine that is a sentiment uh, shared by a lot of folks in the audience. So uh, with that, um, I'm thrilled that actually the last two panels, they kind of stole how I was going to introduce this, but I'm thrilled that what we're talking about today is impact. And because after all, at the end of the day, right, our, our inventions, our innovations, our entrepreneurs and companies are there to provide impact. And so we're going to think a lot uh, on this panel about what's preventing us from having that impact and what are some of the challenges in, in achieving the impact we want to have, right? And I think what's unique about this panel is we've got folks at a different stages in their careers, um, early stage, mid stage, and what I'll call mature stage. Uh, I'll let you guess who's which one of those panelists. And that there are different positions within the academic invention ecosystem. So they can really talk about how they are seeing challenges um, and, and what they're doing to overcome them. So I'll let them each introduce themselves. We'll start with Miri. I'll ask her a question, let her introduce herself along the way with her answer. Um, and starting that, you know, both of you and Karuba have very distinguished careers in your technical fields. And I wanna get an understanding of how you think about your research and your patents intersecting with broader, the broader society and impact and making the world a more livable and equitable place. All right, thank you. Uh, uh, this is Miri Oskan. I'm a professor in electrical and computer engineering department at UC Riverside. We have 10 campuses uh, of UC, and uh, UCR is in the Southern California and one of the campuses. I've been there for about like 21 years, and uh, my my work uh, mainly focuses on the, the energy storage, uh, and that uh, happen to be lithium-ion batteries uh, for uh, powering electrical vehicles or for uh, usage in smart grid applications. And uh, that brings to, you know, we had an earlier discussion, early panel discussion that um, I really want to make the world a better place. And that kind of like uh, reflects back down to what I do as a faculty. And renewable energy sources and uh, with the, all the climate uh, change that we are experiencing. And uh, so for mitigation uh, for the carbon dioxide and how we can remove the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and even in the processes when we are preparing our batteries. So, so those are the points that I also take in uh, to, to make the way that we are making the batteries in a better way. And sustainable, uh, for example, uh, material systems because we have shortage in minerals that makes uh, the lithium ion batteries today because of the huge demand, the, not just on the lithium, but like for example, cobalt, magnesium and uh, manganese and, and others are also uh, a questionable uh, situation at this point with the increasing demand with the EVs and all the others that I mentioned and uh, looking into implementation of renewable sources, natural sources and waste and how can we use all that to make the future batteries and keeping the, the performance at the same time make them cheaper and using for example plastic waste, glass waste 
And uh, we even used, for example, mushrooms as biomass. And, uh, and then uh, we were quoted by uh, Conan O'Brien, actually in his uh, late show, that we come up with the idea while uh, we are using a different type of a mushroom. And uh, so, so uh, literally just thinking out of the box is what I try to do. I have a background in electrical engineering material science, and also in bioengineering. And I try to keep all the views when I am trying to attack to a problem. I know that this was a long introduction, but kind of like explains uh, that uh, what is important for me and why I am here as an inventor. Thank you, Mary. And I think you have a, a background similar to many of the others I've heard talking about today about that interdisciplinary approach. And Karuba, you also have a joint uh, appointment with the College of Engineering and also the College of Agriculture, Food, and Natural Resources. So, so similarly to many others here, the, the field of invention encompasses that interdisciplinary nature. So same question to you. How do you think about your research and, and uh, in the broader context of society? Thanks, Rob. Uh, good, day. good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kiruba Krishnaswamy. And uh, I do have a joint appointment into colleges, College of Engineering in the Department of Biomedical, Biological, Chemical Engineering. And in the College of Agriculture, it's in the Division of Food, Nutrition, and Exercise Sciences. So my area of research focuses on sustainable food systems engineering. So on one side of this uh, challenge that we're addressing around 2 billion people on this planet are affected by hidden hunger, that is due to micronutrient deficiencies. On the other hand, we waste around 1.3 billion tons of edible food that was based as annually. Like waste is a terminology that's created by humans. In nature, there's, uh, that, there's nothing called waste. Everything transforms into something useful. So the question you're asking is, can we learn from nature? And if we can transform this thing called waste, it will not be called as waste, but rather raw materials for a processing. So that could be transformed into food that can feed the people who are in need. So that's the whole idea of our research. And most of our innovations are uh, towards that particular question. Can we convert this into something that can meet the needs of the people? And in the ecosystem, the innovation ecosystem where I sit, I sit in a place where I have interactions with students, innovation teams, and I'm a junior faculty. So, so that's where I sit in the ecosystem and learn about innovation. So. Great. Thank you, Karuba. Um, so Jay, you, um, you're the vice president, not just of one campus, but you're responsible for the whole system, University of Illinois system. Um, talk a little bit about the work you do, um, how it supports uh, both not only the economy of Illinois, but also solves critical social and environmental problems. Uh, thanks, and it's good to be the mature person on this, because um, the alternative wouldn't have me here. Um, so I'm the Vice President for Economic Development and Innovation for the University of Illinois System. That system is three universities, Chicago, Springfield, and Urbana-Champaign. I'm also a faculty member in bioengineering, uh, background in optics. Uh, early on did laser technologies. Somebody here also did that with eyes, um, and uh, Dr. Wynn. And uh, then moved over to diagnostics during, the, during COVID. We did diagnostics for uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, developed the test. I led the clinical trials for that test, uh, got F FDA UA on that, and started two companies um, during that time period. Um, one of them maxed out at 1,000 people, testing uh, 2 million of our, the students in the state of Illinois. So economic impact for us meant getting kids back into school. Um, so that's why uh, they kind of threw it to me to figure out how to do this. Uh, so that gives you a little bit of sense of my background. I also oversee a network of innovation uh, hubs across the state of Illinois. So there's 12 public universities. They're each part of a hub of the Illinois Innovation Network. Um, four of those are minority serving institutions. Um, 10 of them are R2s and two of them are R1s, the one in Chicago and in Urbana-Champaign. Uh, so, you know, it, this, is, uh, this is trying to leverage strengths uh, in rural regions of the state uh, and in urban regions uh, of 
the city of Chicago for the most part. Uh, and, uh, you know, trying to take the, the technologies that are being developed at each of these universities and moving them forward. Uh, previous life, I've been at University of Illinois for two years. I was 12 years as the vice president for research at Northwestern, uh, where I was also a faculty member. And very different. Being at a private, uh, being at a public now versus being in a private, we can have a longer conversation about that. Uh, each of those also has its uh, unique fo focuses and therefore strengths. Um, in the current position, this is a uh, this is trying to leverage the significant investment that the state of Illinois and each of you lives in a state and each of your states is putting significant investment into higher education, and uh, really trying to take those ideas that are. Uh, coming out of those institutions and bring them forward to society. Um, I also oversee the tech transfer offices for the across the whole system, so at each of those universities. And I oversee a venture capital group that we started quite a few years ago. Uh, we're in our fourth round of, uh, of funding that we're, we're starting up. Um, largely, that venture capital group uh, does funding in the state of Illinois. A uh, significant amount of that is folks coming, ideas that are coming out of uh, the major universities. Uh, and uh, the idea is to generate companies from that technology, provide initial funding so that we can move them through some sort of valley of death, uh, and uh, get uh, subsequent seed funding for those. Um, but as I said, it's a venture capital group. It's not the initial seed group, so uh, they have to actually be a little further along those companies uh, as we move forward. Um, so, you know, those are the, those are the levers that I have uh, that I'm pulling and uh, trying to, to move technologies uh, across the whole state, in the cities, in the rural regions. Um, and we can get into more detail if you wish. Great, thanks Jay. And, and as, uh, as I sort of mentioned at the outset, each of you sit at a kind of different place within the ecosystem and have different challenges. And so now getting really into the meat of the panel, it's, uh, I'd like each of the panelists to think about and comment on um, how you see innovation in, originating in the academic setting and what are the challenges to getting that innovation and invention to impact. And as we talked a little bit at, uh, you know, in the green room before, you can complain for a little bit, but then you got to come forth with a couple of thoughts around solutions and, and how can we help fix that process? Go first. You, whoever would like to. And uh, I think what I would like to say is that, uh, this is my quote, by the way, it's, uh, it takes a village, actually, to raise an inventor. And uh, for 21 years that I've been in UC Riverside, and uh, I would like to share my experience yesterday uh, from USPT office, Paul said that, you know, sharing your experiences, I think, is a good way to moving forward. And that's what I am going to do. Uh, when I first joined to UC Riverside uh, as a faculty uh, assistant professor, and uh, after the first year, I started inventing. And, uh, and I wanted to file this uh, invention disclosure. <clears throat> but... The university said that don't invent because we don't have any staff to handle the paperwork. And so this was kind of like interesting, but uh, that didn't hold me. And uh, this is the, uh, I think, uh, persistence that yesterday, I think Gary uh, Michelson was uh, talking about. And uh, so that's why I did not stop and then start, uh, you know, continue uh, inventing and then would like to file all this invention. Uh, then university said, okay, so we don't have any staff to handle this and then we are going to connect you to the president's office. We have a UC president's office at Auckland and uh, they connected to me a staff that I can you know, do the paperwork uh, required filing the patents and disclosures. So that's what happened and how, that's how uh, continued for five years. And uh, after uh, five years and they end up hiring a staff member in the patent office and that's how we start working, you know, on campus. Uh, but uh, the practical problems were uh, all the staff members stayed only one year 
and and they left and they had to hire another one and uh, teach the position and that person stayed for another year and left and then so on so for patent disclosure you know, as you know there's like a, a ticking uh, time and uh, and then uh, so th that's why uh, we end up like being in uh, losing some of our uh, basically uh, patent uh, disclosures so today it's much better so we have a larger uh, uh, patent office where we can uh, I think much easier to file uh, the disclosures and there's one-to-one -one, uh, communication and uh, so this is like an operational side of the, uh, the campus that uh, I think has to improve and the, on the other side, there is the departmental and the college side that I had to face another uh, problem. And uh, me being the very first uh, faculty, not just on the female faculty, uh, but also a faculty trying to file disclosures were not taken well by my department and the college because this is not the norm. And uh, until uh, I'm now, uh, we have step systems in University of California, and now I am a full professor uh, of step six. And I did not even include, I have about 45 uh, patents. I did not even include them into the list of my faculty electronic file because they were not counted uh, and valued uh, for merit and promotion cases. And I just did that, just recently applied for the step six. So that's the time when actually I end up entering all my uh, patents and disclosures, any commercialization activities and all that. What actually is saddening is that there was a remark from the, the college and the department saying that, uh, you know, if I didn't do the service to the department, I would also file a, a patent myself or disclosure myself. So not only, you know, trying to discourage you and uh, uh, filing patents and also uh, not valuing what you are doing. And I think everybody in this room, uh, they are aware that how long does it take and how much energy it takes to start from the filing till all the way to get the patent approved. And it's a long time. Some of them takes six years, seven years, or 10 years. So you have to go back and forth with the patent office and the lawyers to work on your uh, claims and everything. Uh, so, so that's, that's uh, quite uh, saddening. And, uh, but uh, I think this perseverance uh, that we were talking about uh, I don't think this, this was like me being a female faculty and then have more uh, patents than anyone in the college uh, is, the, is the point. But uh, again, the, the cultural difference, the cultural difference that uh, actually the patent, uh, when we file, uh, they miss the point that university owns the patent, right? And then if this patent is going to be uh, licensed to any company or any entity and uh, any uh, benefit that is going to come, it's going to be to the university. I think this is a great service, but this is either not taught like that or they not, uh, not taken by the faculty as that. Uh, so becoming like more classical, I guess. So, so that's the, the fight that I have given over 21 years, but it did not stop me. And so, so that's what uh, I think, that's why I'm saying that it takes a village to uh, raise an uh, inventor. Uh, the departmental, the college, and the campus, uh, the ecosystem that you have to build uh, in order to uh, inspire the faculty or the inventor and, and nurture it and at the same time support it. 
So, so that's how actually going to be a win-win situation for the faculty, for the students, uh, for the inventors, uh, and also for the, the campus. So, so that's the personal story uh, that uh, uh, one of the UC systems, and uh, again, each UC system has a different, uh, I guess, ecosystem. And uh, so that's why this might be different in other UCs. Uh, but this is a true story that still, uh, I think we can make the life better for the faculty who try to be a uh, true inventor. And, and especially, for example, uh, the work, uh, the inventions that uh, I did is directly related to high-performing lithium-ion batteries, which is a strategic technology for the for United States and also a global uh, community. Uh, so that's why, uh, you know, making this transition to commercialization, uh, I think it's going to be a huge impact to the society. So that's why I think everyone, the faculty, uh, the deans and and also the administration of the the campus uh, we have chancellor and a provost they have to look at with a wider angle thanks mary so how is everybody else's ecosystem okay so thanks mary for that 21 years of journey and i do agree it takes a village to have a patent um, and also creating that ecosystem Right. I'm a junior faculty, and uh, at the University of Missouri, we have a really good support system. And uh, that helped me from the invention disclosure to the tech transfer office. So when you have uh, female in innovators, like Dr. Grant is here, and other innovators who have already set some stage or created that safe space that, yes, being a junior faculty, yes, it is possible, then that creates that environment. Yeah, innovation is part of the ecosystem and you are valued for that contribution. So that gives the courage to take the next step. And also the tech transfer office at Mizzou was really helpful. They helped uh, from finding the attorney, the claims. So when you have people that you can go and ask questions, right? it could be a question that might be very simple, but from an innovator standpoint, when you're new to this uh, setup, you might, you might not know where to ask those questions, but having a place to go and ask those questions. And they might not have all the answers, but they could direct us to another place. And so we keep persevering and finding the solution. Having that uh, support system was really helpful for me. And the challenges were like, um, when you are in two different colleges, Navigating the structures, that was a bit um, challenging initially, but then when you have that support system, that is more helpful. And, um, and also I'm still learning. And uh, another, so that's from a faculty, junior faculty who's trying to be a part of the innovation uh, ecosystem. But there's another perspective also from the student's perspective when you have innovation teams. So I get the opportunity to interact with engineering students, science students, journalists, uh, like ag students. So when you have a cohort of teams who are given challenges, in my class I do give them challenges, mostly socially global challenges related to food and nutrition security. And when they come up with solutions, like how do I direct them towards finding, like this is the next step, you have to take your technology too. So that pathway, when you have transdisciplinary teams, that is a bit challenging and I hope we will work to get a good solution there. So, uh, so thanks Ruba and I, we did not pay, uh, or we did not get paid by the previous panel on the the, uh, how well tech transfer offices can work. Um, Jay, you've been in the, the tech transfer business for a long time. You now sit at, at kind of the apex of the whole system, but in your previous uh, role at Northwestern, I'm sure, um, as well as you did your job and as well as you see the folks that you work with now doing their job, where are the areas for opportunities for, um, for improvement, improving that process? Yeah, um, so there, there are a number of areas. Um, 
so let me sort of walk through my thought process on this really quickly. Um, we all walk into situations and we have principles, okay? And the principle with tech transfer, as you heard in the last panel, was impact. So, you know, if you invent something, come, at, come to the tech transfer office and we're trying to figure out how to let your technology have impact. Uh, there might be a money component to that. Um, part of that impact also is how do we, you know, impact the lives of the faculty, the researchers, the students, um, and how do we impact the ecosystem that we try to develop, okay? And that all sounds great until the principles collide with each other. And you start running into challenges of the question of what if two principles run into each other? Um, so that, that is a big challenge, and I'll come back to you asked for solutions. I'll, I'll tell you what we try to do, um, but this is not perfect, and I would love to hear either in question and answer or otherwise after, you know, how you approach, how you deal with conflicts with your own values and principles. Um, because, frankly, that's what I see. And part of the reason I see this is the tech transfer office can handle a lot of things. When there's true challenges, then it pops up to the vice president level. And it's like, uh, Jay, you solved this problem, okay? Um, and maybe you've run into this in your own lives, the grad students who do just fine until they can't, and then it comes to you. Um, so that's the first thing I would say, is we have principles and the challenges come when they collide with each other. I was listening, okay? Having infrastructure is really important, and in particular human infrastructure. And the human infrastructure usually is a tech transfer office. Maybe it's a center for innovation. Maybe you have entrepreneurs and residents. Maybe you have a whole program for your undergrads and grad students. Uh, raise your hand if you have a whole program for your postdocs. How many of you actually have a curriculum for your postdocs? Okay, I, I think I saw one hand go up, okay? I, not many universities have a curriculum for a really important subset of those we train called postdocs. We bring them in, they work in a lab, but do they really have a curriculum? We're training them, we're educating them, but as educators, we don't provide. I'm looking now because I'm trying to block the sun. To, the sun yeah. I'm an optics guy and I can't even recognize where my light's coming from. Okay, so you know, there, this infrastructure, and there are some universities that bring postdocs into this training process. That is really important to be able to move things along. So it's not just the faculty member who's pushing on this, it's also the grad students and the postdocs who are putting pressure on moving the technology forward. This all comes down to you need a strategy. And then has been said many times in this conference, culture is absolutely vital. And culture is really challenging. In my career, I've been in this for a while. Um, you know, started off with why are you bothering with patents back in the 80s when I started doing this. Um, and now we've really changed that culture, okay? We can have this conversation. You can safely sit up here and, you know, you're not going to have people writing letters saying, why the heck are you doing that? And you're never going to get tenure. That doesn't really happen anymore. The question is how much impact will that have is another question. But nobody's going to say, don't do that. So, you know, culture is a really important part of this. And that's part of the solution is we have to start changing the culture. And there, the cultural shift is we have to start listening to all the folks. So listening to the faculty involved, listening to the grad students as to what they want, listening to the companies who might want a license. And they have very different ideas than the faculty and the grad students and the universities as to how they want their tech, these technologies that come out of the universities to be available to them. Some of them want exclusive. Some don't give a hoot about exclusive. They'll take a nerf. They'll take a, a non-exclusive royalty free, okay? But if you give me $200 million to set up a center, you might have some thoughts about what the foreground IP looks like, and you might want her background IP for free. Because you want all the background IP. And that's where you get a cultural clash. So you have to start listening to the companies that are putting a lot of money into these universities to create foreground IP and expect to be able to practice that foreground IP because you're giving them a non-exclusive royalty-free license and you don't want to, they don't want to be blocked by your background IP and especially by background IP that has maybe nothing to do with the faculty who are involved. 
but may have something to do with what background IP you brought to the game or you brought to the game. And that's where it gets challenging as a VP to sit there and try to figure out what impact this will have. This big grant that's coming in from this company that's gonna help develop foreground IP that will change the world in batteries or solar or genetics, and they want the background IP. I can't tell you the number of times I get pulled into a conversation about background IP. It is a real challenge. And the solution to that is to pull everybody together and really listen to people. And that's hard. It's really hard for faculty to sit there and listen how their background IP, their IP that is not licensed, that they would love to license, and they can't start a company because they can't get the money, some other company is going to come along and scoop that up for free in five years. And it happens. So that requires conversations with lots of folks, department heads who want a cut of the money, deans who want a cut. OK, that may have lit a fire as a last session, maybe, hopefully. There you go. Yeah, well, so we're going to move into the, the Q&A uh, portion of this. And I, and I would encourage folks, my guess is a number of you have had experiences similar to our panelists. So um, I encourage questions, but also encourage pithy comments uh, um, that are similar stories, whether they're challenges or whether they're solutions. Because uh, I think, as, as Miri said, you know, one UC campus is one UC campus, and I'm sure that's sure for, for the rest of you as well. Everybody has their own challenges. As you are making, I see one over there, but as you're making your way or thinking about it, I do want to ask the panelists just one quick thing that you can think about that you would give as a suggestion to folks as they leave the conference and they go back to their universities. What one thing do you think they can do to help change the culture there? Uh, actually, earlier in the panel, so we were talking about how different uh, NAI is than the other uh, academies, like National Academies of Engineering and Science. I think having chapters is a wonderful thing, and uh, the, because it involves both uh, students and uh, postdocs and faculty and also the staff. So I think training, it's kind of like a seed training, if you like, you know, just uh, start making uh, an impact locally is the best way uh, to change this uh, culture and thinking. And then telling and teaching the faculty that actually filing this patent disclosure in a, a very high impact uh, technology uh, can benefit to the university. So, uh, so this is a great service to the university, a great service to the college and the department. Uh, so, so that's why uh, uh, I think these uh, chapters are like super important. And uh, I think that's, that makes the NII uh, different uh, than uh, from any other national academy. Great, thanks. Karuba. So, um Innovation does happens at those intersections. And when we have these intersections, like we'll have different perspectives. Right? So as Jay said, listening is so critical because sometimes our perspectives might not meet the same idea that we have, but we could find a common ground that leads to more inclusive voices being heard and create more innovations that can have societal impacts. So listening and also opening our minds to have different perspectives. Drive innovation throughout your curriculum. Uh, for years, I was at Northwestern and said the most innovative group in the entire university is in the theater department. We produced John Heston, Julia Louise Dreyfus, and a guy named Stephen Colbert, and that's just the beginning. And if you don't think Colbert runs in a really important company that impacts the United States, you should stay up later. Well, I, I really didn't think Stephen Colbert was going to make it to this conference today. So <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you for that surprise and bringing that. Uh, question or comment over here? Rock, uh, Rock Mackey, Wisconsin. Um, I found that uh, faculty are becoming a lot more interested in entrepreneurship. And in fact, Wisconsin started something called the, uh, called the Association of Campus Entrepreneurs to actually lobby for entrepreneurship. And, 
I think some of your, I think now that I'm a member of, of this organization, uh, you know, I will try to, to, to vector them towards being, uh, becoming a, a uh, chapter, uh, because especially if there's some support for campus entrepreneurship through, uh, through your organization. But I think the other big thing that would change culture is to get middle management, in other words, deans and chairmen, uh, to get behind it. Because they're really asked to, you know, uh, you know how many students do you have? Uh, how much indirect are you, are you making? What is, uh, how, many, how many female and minority faculty do you have? Um, and, um, and what's your time to graduation? And if they're asked, in fact, in this particular case, you'd have to tell them that more entrepreneurs is better, not worse, right? Because some of them probably think that more entrepreneurs are worse. So, so if, you, if you were to add that fifth big bullet uh, to what they report uh, to the chancellor or the president uh, and, the, and the regents or whatever of the university, uh, I, think, I think numbers do matter and, and that count matters. And in fact, you know, in my institution, Wisconsin, we can't even get, nobody can get the information from the conflict of interest committee because that's viewed as somehow secret information, which is crazy, right? It's absolutely crazy. It should be public information by definition. Um, and and so, so we need to change culture kind of in pieces, but more disclosure, including from the university is good and more information that the university provides the, the state and the citizens of, of in public universities would be better. I, Great, have quick, I have a quick follow-up comment on that. So you're standing there, and you know I recognize you're from Madison, and um, you know, and you had a bunch of presidents sitting up here, and there's an expectation that they drive change, or that a vice president can drive change. You know, I've, I've sat in a position like this for a long time. Change happens at the faculty level. That's really where it's driven within a university. So you know, there there are a number of you, maybe even some of you who are more senior than I am. Um, you have tremendous impact within a university. And, you know, so don't expect it totally from the top. You're no, it. No, we're, no, we're not. I, I don't think we are expecting it from, from the top. But, but I, th I do think that the top uh, is, the, is the only organ. Uh, the chancellor of the president is the only one that can tell the, the deans what to do. And the deans are the only people that can tell the chairs what to do. So it ultimately has to come down from the top. And you can tell the president. Oh, yes. Yeah. So we, we, and, and, you know, ACE did this all the time, the Association yep. of Camp, uh, Campus Entrepreneurs. And maybe your, maybe your uh, chapters can do the same thing. Yeah, and I think that certainly resonates with what I've, I've been hearing uh, recently. It's, it's both top down and, and bottom up. And so you're not powerless regardless of where you sit, um, right. you know, in the, in the hierarchy, but, if, but no matter where you sit, you probably can't do it without someone else at a different level being uh, assisting and helping. Let, let me follow on with that. Alex Signatz of Houston. Um, and I said this before in this meeting that, that you know, there, there are two cultures, at least I've seen two cultures in the university. Uh, one is the upcoming culture of innovation and, and, uh, uh, and that and and inventing, and one is the traditional culture uh, of you know publish and perish scenarios, and uh, you know the universities are not very democratic necessarily, okay, um, and and so therefore there's there's this clash that still happens. It's changing slowly, but the clash is still there. And so how do you change the cultures at least at least allow them to interact as uh, you know positively uh, and, and, and move forward from this. I, I don't see that happening just yet. I could keep talking, but I think I should let you <laughs> folks talk too. Yeah, I think... Okay, sorry, I asked. Again, no, the, the chapters, I think, is the way to see this information or this change into individual institute or university because it includes, again, the students, uh, staff, and postdocs, and the faculty. Uh, so that's, that's how I think uh, change can start, you know, initiate it, nucleate it, and then grow. Uh, but uh, it's not going to happen like this. As I said, you know, I've been there for 21 years, and I, 
it took uh, 21 years for people start saying that, uh, okay, you know, like uh, the patents are important, it takes a lot of time, and then uh, it will pay back to the university and it's, it's a great service. So, so it, uh, it shouldn't take this long, but as uh, this, uh, I think, uh, coming back to the chapters is, is quite impactful uh, if it is being utilized uh, efficiently. So my quick response, get your colleagues who are academy members, either this academy or one of the other academy members, to be in agreement and individually or jointly go to your dean and make sure that the letter who comes, that comes from the dean regarding promotion and tenure, ask the question to the letter writers to comment on the impact of innovation and uh, invention and entrepreneurship for each of the candidates. Maybe that letter exists already. And then ask the question, how much does the committee, there's always a dean level committee, how much do they value this characteristic in your, in your faculty? I'm telling you, you have a lot of power. You may not feel like it, but that's okay. When you sit here, I also don't feel like I have a ton of power either, so yeah. Uh, this is what the, somebody else called permission. Sir? So I have a, a story. I'm a storyteller. I'm Jim Wynn from IBM Research, and this is a story about Paul Lauterbur. Uh, I noted that Stony Brook suddenly is one of the major uh, um, universities that's involved as a, a university member. So it, it turns out that I was a manager, and in 87, I became manager of someone who was providing technology to Paul Lauterbur when Paul was at Stony Brook. This would be 87, 88. Now, I didn't meet Paul at that time, but I was funding him. Now, I did meet him later in, in uh, 1990s after he had moved to Illinois, uh, uh, Urbana-Champaign, and he told me the following story. So in 1970, Ray Demadian conceived of MRI, but didn't know how to do it. He has a patent, but the patent doesn't have an embodiment that works. Uh, some one of Paul, Paul had worked on NMR for chemical analysis through the 50s and 60s, and a student of his told him about the Mabian's uh, concept and, and invention. I don't know if the patent was issued yet for the Mabian, but but the idea was out. So Paul thought about it, and he actually thought of the way to do MRI, which is something called gradient field imaging. So after he had the idea, he went to his department chair and asked how would he go about patenting this thing and Stony Brook did not have a technology transfer organization back in 1970-71 so they sent him to an external lawyer and what Paul told me was that the external lawyer says well it looks like it'll work but what good is it <laughs> so he didn't patent it instead he published a paper about grading field imaging and he actually made some measurements I think on a a mouse or rat or something and showed that he could have a, an MRI spectrum. Now, Demadian recognized this and he adopted Lauterbus technology to his company, Phonar, and he did the first imaging, but using Lauterbus uh, technique. And then they kind of didn't always get along. And uh, what Lauterbus told me is when they shared the National Medal of Technology, uh, Demadian wouldn't shake his hand. <laughs> but Stony Brook realized what a terrible mistake they made, so they created a, uh, a, a technology transfer organization, which is now in, now in full force. Now, when Paul won the Nobel Prize with Peter Mansfield in um, 2003, Ray Demadian took out two page, full page ads every week from the announcement until the Nobel Prize presentation in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, and the Wall Street Journal with a picture of his um, embodiment from his patent, the one that doesn't work, and the Nobel medal turned upside down, <laughs> saying he should have been the third novelist. <laughs> and uh, I think Ray Domenian still has a company, Phonar, which uses uh, a lot of his technology. But this is sort of an interesting story, and it just sort of comes to mind when I saw how Stony Brook is up there now with a lot of patents, and then um, what because they didn't have a technology transfer organization back at the time when Lauterbur recognized how to do MRI. At, uh, at the end, 
is still on the Ponar uh, front page on their website. Really? It is. <laughs> We're still today. It's still today. <laughs> that, that, that embodiment with the, the, the coil wrapped around the it doesn't work. Ray didn't recognize it. He couldn't focus my voice down to such a small spot. Rich Meager, University of Georgia. This is probably kind of a reductionist uh, comment maybe about, uh, about one approach, but I have had uh, some success talking to junior faculty members who, uh, are, who have something to patent or to commercialize. And, um, and I've been asked by my university to talk to these individuals. And usually I find they just don't see the strategy of sort of disclosing, uh, publishing, while that paper is being getting ready to be published your patent is being submitted. And this timing is actually pretty critical to the success of the patent and to your not disclosing things you don't want to before you, you want to. So usually I have my, in my case, I tell them, get the paper all written, get a rough draft of it before anybody, before you're handing it around to everybody, give it to the patent office, get that provisional submitted. Now this is a very particular thing to an area of biotechnology. And some projects lend themselves to this, and some, you know, if it's, you've got to have mouse data and it takes three years, well, this gets to be difficult to do. But still, I think it's still a kind of a good plan. Disclose, get ready to publish, submit your patent. And that, that kind of, I don't know how many other, well, that probably must work for people in electronics also, I would think. So anyway, go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you for that uh, comment. Because as a, as a junior faculty or early uh, career innovators, first question comes is, is this um, worth invention disclosure, right? First, as an inventor or as a person who's doing lab work and finding these curiosity-driven, like, you know, solutions, getting that past, like, from uh, a personal standpoint, is this worth an invention disclosure? That itself is the first hurdle for a junior faculty. Like, I'm just talking from my experience or from colleagues who are in the same mm -hmm. age group, I would say. So then when we have these type of doubts, we had, like, you know, there was a session with the tech transfer office and um, the Sam Bish, the person who's uh, amazing, he says, please bring whatever invention you feel that it is worth, just bring it to us, have a discussion. And then we will see whether, where we can find a home for this. And so that's really helpful for me as a junior faculty going and presenting my ideas. Hey, this is what I feel, this is innovative in this. So what do you think? And getting feedback early on. And then say that, then they give this, okay, this is worth protecting. So you may want to, uh, you're planning for publication, that's good because you're, you're in a tenure track, you need to get published, but also find a way that we could help you. So finding that balance, finding that, that's why it's so important to have that ecosystem. Someone can understand the importance of publication as well as uh, protecting the IP. So having a tech transfer officer who can understand and help you out. Yeah, and the, the other reason for the early disclosure, you know, is obviously a legal one that the university wants a record of you having had this idea. When did you first, on the form that we have, when did you first have this idea? Who have you told about it? You know, all this kind of stuff. And those are really important things to have on file. And, and I've had a couple of cases where 12 months later, like I planned, I had a paper. But quite often it was three years later <laughs> that I had the, the draft of the paper written, right? But I think having a disclosure early and then this, this, this kind of pattern but it's very hard for a young faculty member who's just struggling, he's going to get his first grant, he's doing his first teaching, and he's got this new, a lot of new ideas, but it's very hard for them to actually see their way through that. So I think having advice to young faculty, at least from the bottom up part of this, um, and someone asked about this earlier, I guess it was Paul Sandberg. When I first went to Georgia, I had actually cloned the first plant promoter, which later on Monsanto and all these companies used for herbicide resistance, right? I could not get the university to patent it. I was told that I was really a, you know, a, uh, uh, a misled faculty member because this was morally corrupt thing for faculty members to do, to be worried about commercializing things, you know? <laughs> so they got it for free, basically. <laughs> so, yeah. I just wanna kind of like uh, add something uh, small here that I think the challenges are there at any level, not just, uh, you know, junior uh, faculty, but mid-career faculty and senior faculty. Uh, because the, the filing, the disclosures and working on the patents is one thing, one challenge. 
And the other uh, a bigger elephant is uh, transferring this technology uh, for the commercialization. So that requires a different uh, class of uh, experience, which uh, is lacking from the university. And we have, uh, you know, basically patents and, and all that being approved globally and US-wide and so on and so forth. But the next step is uh, the support system is not there. So uh, I think we need to ecosystem that we were talking about uh, has to be taught both at the, uh, you know, junior level and, and also mid and senior level as well because the challenges are different and transferring and pushing that big elephant out of the, uh, the college and the university out there for commercialization. I think that's the big really elephant that uh, <clears throat> needs attention. And, uh, and then that's, uh, that's why uh, we also need uh, a supportive ecosystem and uh, people that we can work with uh, and going out there promoting our technology. And uh, maybe people are looking for the technology that I have, but nobody knows about it. So, so, so that's, that's, the, that's the part that I think uh, needs a lot of work uh, also. Thanks, Mary. I, I see over here we're out of time, but we're all going to be up afterwards. So you can feel free to come comment and, and ask us a question afterwards. I know you were going to make a final comment. So quickly, last comment. Reading body language. After all this Zoom, you can see body language still. Um, my quick comment was, you know, I hope the culture has changed in Georgia and elsewhere. Yeah, okay. So yeah, it has changed. And what you're bringing up is now that we've got some culture change, what I just heard is, and you just commented on this, is that we need strategy for all these folks who now are being told, let's move it. Um, so. Yep. Thank you very much. Great, great panel. Great discussion. Thank you for the questions. Please join me in thanking the panel and uh, good luck at changing the culture as you all get back home.